everyone, it's me, Aaron, Professor Thorgy, your guide to all things geeky, and welcome to another comic class, Minisode. That's right, it's the show on this channel where I just give you a quick recommendation for a book that you can find in your local comic book store right now, or it's where I come in here and just give you my thoughts and a review of a big, giant book that just got released that everyone is talking about, and unfortunately this week, it is the latter, because we have to come in here and talk about another giant crossover event where two teams have to go at each other and there's going to be some secret revealed that forces them to fight and... Didn't I just do this last week? Hold on. There's something different about this one though. I actually kind of like this one. And don't get me wrong, if you watched last week's episode where I talked about Humans vs. X-Men, I know that I came in here and I said it was actually pretty well written. It was actually a pretty good issue number one. However, I had to put an asterisk on there because I still didn't like the entire premise behind it. I didn't like the entire reason why they had to do it. It was just being handled well for that one issue. It's very odd to talk about Justice League vs. Suicide Squad because I like this issue. And I don't have to add anything on to that. I liked it. So thanks for joining me today on this Common Class Minute. Wait, I have five more minutes to fill? Cool. I can stretch this out. Yes, I wanted to come in here and just talk about Justice League vs. Suicide Squad real quickly because I've been doing a lot more reviews of big event books. And you guys seem to be enjoying that. So I decided, you know what? Let me stop focusing on Marvel for five seconds and go over to DC and focus on their big storyline in which the Justice League finds out about the existence of the Suicide Squad and they decide enough is enough. It's time for us to go in there and put a stop to this. And I gotta say, right off the bat, I kind of dug why the Justice League was doing this. They weren't just doing it because, oh my god, these supervillains are going out there and they're being released back into the public. They also did it because they cared about the villains, which the heroes should. The heroes should be going in there going, listen, if anybody is putting themselves in danger, we want to try and help. We want to try and stop that. And Amanda Waller is using these villains. Yeah, don't get me wrong. We're ticked at these villains. We don't want them going out there and being freed. Excuse me for a second. Oh, man. Excuse me. Don't know where that came from, couldn't hold it in any longer. What if this is like the beginning of me getting incredibly sick and we're going to be able to go back and look at the progression from video to video as I just slowly degrade? Anywho, going back to this issue, I actually really dug that the Justice League was like, no, yeah, we don't want these villains going out there, but at the same time, Amanda Waller is using them. We have to go in there and make them realize they are being used by this manipulative, evil, sick lady who just wants to send them out there to die as if they are not human beings. It's so weird for me to see Batman coming in here and being like, Deadshot, I'm on your side in this one, brother. Trust me, I'm here to help you. Don't get me wrong, this is what Batman should be. Just it's been a while since I've seen that Batman, so it was pretty cool to see that. But at the same time, I think that the Suicide Squad was actually being captured pretty well, and that makes sense because this book is actually being written by the guy who writes the Suicide Squad book. However, if you've watched my reviews of all the Rebirth books, you know, I was kind of hot and cold on the Suicide Squad series. I really liked the Rebirth issue, but then the main series itself, I was kind of mad on. And I said, I honestly think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that they got Jim Lee to draw the book, and whenever Jim Lee draws a book, he also kind of has some influence on the story as well because it takes him so long to draw a book that, yeah, he's going to come in there and be like, okay, this is what I already got planned out and this is what I want to do. So it makes sense that when this writer is actually allowed to work with a different artist where he can just kind of tell the story that he wants to, yeah, he can actually craft a much better story. And I actually really like the way that the Suicide Squad was portrayed in this issue. I actually really dug that when the suicide, that, sorry, that when the Justice League came in there, I was like, listen, we're on your side, you're being used. Harley Quinn was just like, what are you gonna do? Send us back to jail? I just thought, yeah, that is the perfect response to that because of course the Suicide Squad isn't going to trust the heroes. They don't trust Waller either, but they view both of them as being the villains. They view the Justice League and Man Waller as being the same, except that Waller is actually giving them an opportunity to get out of jail, whereas the Justice League is just going to shove them right back in there. So I actually think that that added some dimensions to the squad. It actually made me look at them and go, all right, 
I can see why when the Justice League shows up, you really want to fight them. And I love that Destro, I'm sorry, not Destro, Deadshot actually sat there and said, Say it, Waller. I want to hear you say it. When he was telling her to give them the order to fight the Justice League. Because, yeah, this is something they've been waiting for. This is something that they have always wanted to do, to take on the Justice League. And so to actually get that order, I can understand why he needed to actually hear those words. It was actually just a very therapeutic thing for him. Uh, but I also had to sit there for a second and go, no way can the squad actually beat the league. Because Superman on his own could probably take out every single one of them combined, except for Enchantress, simply because he's weak to magic. So just throw in Wonder Woman there on his side as well, and bam, the two of them could easily handle the whole situation. Hell, Wonder Woman herself could probably handle the whole situation. So yeah, I looked at that and was like, how are you going to make me believe that these two are actually going to be able to fight each other? But then Deadshot actually gives a pretty darn good speech about how, yeah, listen, we always go into suicide situations. And you know why we always survive? Because we're willing to go beyond that edge. We're willing to kill, and you're not. We have the advantage here. And it actually did make me look at these two very unbalanced teams and go, all right, let's see what happens when they fight. And that's the other thing that I have to applaud this series for. We're at issue one, and we already have them going head to head. That was one of the other things I had to say about Inhumans vs. X-Men. Listen, again, that little asterisk in there. I don't want to see this actually happen, but if you're going to give me a series called Inhumans vs. X-Men, it was kind of nice that in issue one, we got Inhumans vs. X-Men. As opposed to Civil War II, where it was, whose side are you on? And these heroes are going to have to fight. And then we got to like the halfway point of the series, and the teams hadn't even been decided. I was like, what on earth is taking you so long in this? In this one, issue one, bam, teams going at each other. Good pacing, way to go. But of course, the squad fighting the league is not the big draw of this whole event. The big draw is that there is actually a secret team of villains being formed by Maxwell Lord, who if you are familiar with the pre-New 52 stuff, you know why that is bad news. He is putting a team together of the worst of the worst villains. And I love that he actually starts this book off by breaking into a prison that is said to house the biggest worst villains. Like it is some black site where they are said to not exist, just completely off the map. And I love that because I looked at it and went, oh, so basically he's gathering together his own Suicide Squad and they are 10 times worse than the regular Suicide Squad. And those kind of confirm when you get to the end of the book and he's talking to them and he says, yeah, listen, I believe we can do some good. This country, this world, it needs saving. And I believe that you're the team to do it. And you're going to work with me on this. And I was like, wow, it really is his own suicide squad. That's just really cool to me that the villains of this big crossover event is an evil version of the Suicide Squad, an already evil team. But there's something else that he says that makes me realize this is going beyond just the surface level heroes fighting villain stuff, because on his team is the Emerald Empress, who was a Legion of Superheroes villain, and the Legion of Superheroes have kind of been in this weird spot ever since the New 52 began, because they got some books in the New 52, but then they didn't sell well, so they basically came in and said, yeah, since those take place in the future, it's taking place in a future that doesn't exist. The Legion of Superheroes does not exist in the New 52, which was just a weird thing to say because even if their books don't sell, the Legion still feel like they're an important part of the DC Universe. However, when Rebirth came around, we saw some Legion of Superhero characters popping up in the modern day and they're talking about being from the future and how they're set now in this weird world that they're trying to figure out. And I was like, okay, so they're trying to bring the Legion back. And like I said, Emerald Empress, who was a villain of the Legion of Superheroes, is now on Maxwell Lord's team. So the fact that she's on this team, it does let me know, okay, they do have someone playing with the Legion. There is going to be some kind of event where they have the characters from the future getting lost in the past or something like that. However, there is another line that Maxwell Lord says in which he kind of mimics the opening lines of the Rebirth one-shot in which he's talking about how he loves this world but something's wrong with it. And I was like, okay, so does Maxwell Lord also know about Dr. Manhattan creating the New 52 universe and how this universe isn't right? And then he also mentions that all the people he's gathered together on this team are people who are not from here. Like, it's pretty vague what he says, but judging from the fact that Emerald Empress is there, it lets me know, okay, well, she's not from here, she's from the future. So does that mean that every other character here is from like an alternate reality or something? And I looked at that team 
and they've got Lobo on there, and not the young hungry Lobo that they gave us in the new 52. I'm talking old school biker Lobo, and the whole point of Rebirth is to come in and go, listen, we know we screwed up with some of these interpretations of characters in the new 52, and Lobo was indeed one of those characters, so if we're getting old school Lobo in here, that's great, but... I honestly, at first I thought, okay, well, maybe it was the young, hunky Lobo that we got, and now he's gotten a little bit older, he's gotten a little bit gruffer, and he's kind of turning into the old school Lobo. But it was that vague thing that he said about how they're each not from here that made me go, could it be possible that this Lobo actually is from the pre-New 52 universe? Because Lobo's whole stick was that he couldn't die. And I don't mean he had a healing factor, I mean, it didn't matter what you did to him, he would keep coming back. So could it be possible that out of all the characters to survive the destruction of the pre-New 52 universe, Lobo is the one who came crawling back through into this reality? I would be kind of opposed to him being the last survivor, but you know, hey, we got Superman, we got Wally West in there, so we do have other survivors. It just seems like he would be the weirdest third choice to pick from the old universe, but as I said, there actually could be an explanation for it. He is a guy who was known for surviving anything. So if that's what they plan on doing, and they actually do plan on pulling the old Lobo out of the pre-New 52 universe, I would kind of be okay with that. But yeah, issue one, it set up a lot of cool things to come in the rest of this series. It also got the Justice League versus the Suicide Squad started right off the bat. So like I said, excellent pacing, and does have me interested in where this series is going to go. As I said, it is very weird for me to come in here and talk about a big crossover event where heroes are fighting each other and not really have any problems with it. Not really have any asterisks that I need to add in there. This is just a fun crossover event. So if you are a fan of either of these two teams, I highly recommend picking this book up. And if you did pick it up, let me know in the comments down below what you thought about it. Also, make sure that you follow me on Twitter and Tumblr at Professor Thorgy. You can let me know your thoughts there as well. So thank you guys for watching another Comic Class Minisode. Come back next time. Bye.